text this morning is uh, the gospel, Mark chapter 10, and the, uh, the disciples in Jesus are on the road going up to Jerusalem. And I asked this the first service, and there was silence. Why do people always go up? They go up the mountain where the temple is. Yeah, if you want to go worship at the, at the temple or you want to do anything else at the temple, you always have to go up because it's shining for everyone to see. So they're on the road and they're walking along. Jesus is actually walking in front of the disciples because that's a rabbinic custom. The students respectfully follow and listen as the teacher walks ahead of them and teaches. And if you think about it, that's exactly what happens with sheep. The shepherd always leads the sheep as he talks to them. It's great. We get to learn what the Lord has to teach us as we follow him. His voice is the one that we follow. We don't follow the voice of a stranger. We only follow his. And Jesus began to tell them what is going to happen to him, saying, you know, look guys, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, the the legal eagles of the day, if you will, and they're going to condemn him to death. And they're going to deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, they will spit on him, they will flog him, and they will kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. And the students wisely said, yeah, So, what do you want? No, they didn't. Not quite then. It wasn't the first time that the disciples had heard what is going to happen to Jesus. Jesus had warned them several times because he cared about them so much. He didn't want them to be scattered all over the place without any hope, thinking, what in the world has just happened to our teacher? As a matter of fact, earlier on in this same uh, book, Jesus tells them that the Son of Man is going to suffer many things, and he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. And as he's speaking very openly about this, Peter, I have to confess something. Peter is my all-time hero next to Jesus, because he is such a bozo. (laughs) Peter takes Jesus aside, and he starts to rebuke him. He's going to correct him. Lord, why are you sounding so defeated? You're the king. You've come in to set up a whole new kingdom. How are you going to do that if you die? Makes no sense. What does it mean? What does it really mean, Lord, when you start talking about you're going to rise again? What, what, what is it that you want? And Peter says, I will even die for you. And, and the Lord's response, I, I sometimes think it was harsh, but it, it really wasn't. It was just, it cut right down to the point Jesus is rebuked, and Jesus says, Satan, get out of my sight, because you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Unwittingly, the disciples were were saying to Jesus exactly what Satan wanted Jesus to hear. Here's the chance to save yourself. Here's the chance to get away from this, Jesus. All you have to do is bow down and serve me. 
All you have to do is walk away. You don't have to die. And Jesus simply knows what's going on. Do you remember early in the Gospels, Satan is tempting Jesus 40 days? And the reason he's tempting Jesus is right off the bat, he wants Jesus to abandon his mission, to come and die for us, to save us. And he's doing it all over again. Even though Peter is mouthing the words, it's Satan trying to distract him. Jesus simply says, get out of here. I don't want to have anything to do with you, Satan. I'm here on my father's mission. And hearing, you know, all the, the Lord's words of love and compassion and redemption and giving them upfront warning about what's going to happen to him. James and John, having heard it all, came up to him and simply said, yeah, but teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. What would you like me to do? Grant us to sit one at your right side, one at your left side in glory. That's what we want, because that is what we want. Simple translation. Lord, after they kill you, we really want to have the honorary seats next to you in glory. We want to sit on your right-hand side, typically reserved for the, the next person in power. And we're pretty powerful. The other one wants to sit on the left, the position typically of a knowledgeable advisor. So can you imagine the guys advising the Lord on what he needs to be doing? I don't think so. And, you know, it, if it wasn't so silly, if it wasn't such a weird request, it would, be, it would be laughable. But it is not laughable to Jesus. You don't know what you're asking, guys. Are you able to drink from the cup that I am going to drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? And here's where you need to sort of unpack some of these words so you really get a better glimpse at what the Lord's saying. When the, the Jewish uh, would speak of a cup, it was a metaphor, typically. It was a metaphor for the joy or for judgment of God. There's joy in Psalm 116. I'll lift up the cup of God's salvation and I will call on the name of the Lord. There's joy in that cup. And then there's the terror in the other cup, the judgment in Psalm 75. It is God who executes judgment, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup of wrath. It's foaming wine, and someone will drink it down. And that's the cup that Jesus is going to drink for us. He's going to drink down to the very empty cup, the very wrath of God that's meant for us. The baptism expresses a, a similar metaphor. In the Old Testament, it's the picture of being overwhelmed with, with calamity. Psalm 69 says, I sink in deep mire where there is no help, where there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. It's the calamitous judgment that Jesus is thinking about that's going to come upon him. Are any of us able to drink that? To be baptized like that? Thank God there is one who is able. James and John, however, confident as ever, 
and likely without full comp comprehension of what's going to come, said to Jesus, yeah, Lord, we are able to do that. And Jesus' response was simple. The cup that I drink, you are going to drink. The calamity, the baptism that I'm going to go through, you are going to go through it. And they did. What they wanted, what they wanted Jesus to do, what James and John were hoping for, they didn't get. What they got was persecution, being beaten, being jailed, suffering greatly. But they did it for the joy of knowing the truth in Jesus Christ that he took all of it. He took the cup of wrath. He was baptized, and now they are following him. James was the first apostle to be killed by the sword of King Herod. John, after years of persecution and going into exile, was the last apostle to die. And they did it for the joy of knowing God, for being able to follow him, hearing him, and like sheep, going with their good shepherd. What do you want? And, you know, I'd ask you the same thing. What is it that you want? I mean, really. Do you want your will? Or do you want his will? Do you want what you want because you want it? Or do you simply want to follow the Lord and gather everything that he wants for you? Text says, let our love be genuine. That's what the Lord wants for all of us, to have love that is genuine. genuine. He wants us to hold on to what is good. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to outdo one another in showing honor and serving the Lord. He wants us to rejoice in hope. Anybody up for that? I would argue there's a whole world that's looking for some kind of hope at this point. And we've got it. All we need to do is ask, do you want it? I say this frequently. You will never be able to beat anyone over the head in order to have them believe. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We simply speak we tell what we know that God loves us in Jesus Christ and during this Lenten season we're getting together to journey with Jesus up that hill to that cross which he took for us so I pray for all of us as we prepare for Easter that we simply celebrate that God loves us dearly. In the name of Jesus, amen.